Another question we want to ask is what is considered respectful and disrespectful in the family? This is really important because families are welcoming us into their homes. That can be quite intrusive. And we really need to learn their cultural expectations and make sure that we're being respectful when we're there. Um, there's lots of different examples of this. For example, taking off your shoes. Sim as simple as that. Um, some families take off their shoes, some don't. Um, I had a family who would always offer me, when I'd take off my shoes, she would always offer me slippers. And at first I was like, oh no, no, don't worry about it. And I, was, I thought I was being polite. And then I realized, oh no, maybe she doesn't want me to be barefoot in her house, right? Like maybe she actually really wants me to wear them. So now I always take the slippers. So like you kind of have to watch what's mm. happening in the house and, and make sure you're being respectful. Um, another example, Japanese culture, punctuality is, show of, is a sign of respect. So we even have a saying, be five minutes early to everything, that's the norm. So being five minutes, ten minutes late for a meeting with a Japanese family, again, because they want to maintain harmony, may not say anything to you, but they may feel like, you know, we're not important enough so that they can be on time, right? So that could be something else. And Parb was mentioning too, she had an experience where she was supporting a family, uh, a Syrian refugee family actually, and they tended to be late quite often. And that was causing some troubles for the other professional because they would gather and they would be late. And she, when she spoke to, I think, I don't know who it was she spoke to, but had knowledge. Multi multicultural worker. Multicultural yeah. worker. She, she, she um, d disclosed that in, often in refugee camps, they don't have access to, to clocks very often. So they just, that, you know, they weren't very aware of that or they, that wasn't, no, um, they, they just weren't aware of that. So mm -hmm. knowing that information would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, some families um, want to offer food and drinks when you're at the house. Um, I, Parvs was telling us that she's she gluten-free, gluten she's gluten intolerant, I'm not sure, but uh, she ate the food because she felt like she was going to be disrespectful if she didn't eat the food, even though there was gluten in it. Um, and another one is um, how you address um, the family members as well. So some family members, um, they like we often address parents by their first name. But I've had some um, Chinese families that I work with who, when I asked how they wanted to be addressed, they would say Mrs. Blank. So th those are some things to, to think about. Um, I have an experience, sorry, yeah, I had an experience ahead. working with a family of Chinese background and all the kids in the family called me auntie and I've never had that happen to me before so I was like, oh, oh that, that was, that I didn't understand but then I found out that again, you just can't call, they, it would be disrespectful for them to call me Mariko so that was kind of the, the way they would address adults with auntie so-and-so, uncle so-and-so, so oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> that was learning again for me. Yeah, and even though that might make you feel uncomfortable, that is part of their culture. Um, I've also had uh, uh, also cultural expectations of um, what's appropriate for clothing. I had a family who um, had some concerns about how some of the BIs were dressing in their home. So they reached out. They didn't feel comfortable talking to the BIs directly, but they talked to us and asked us to maybe just send out a very general reminder of appropriate clothing. Mm -hmm. um, while at work. So. <laughs> and for me, working with Japanese families, again, I'm very, very cautious of what I wear. I don't wear low-cut v-necks because part of our interactions require a lot of bowing and deep bowing, so therefore I can't do this with a v-neck, so that would be inappropriate. So simple things like that that you don't even think about can potentially affect the relationship that you have and the rapport you build with the family, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And you know, how do we learn about these cultural expectations? I think a lot of it is just being open-minded and observing, just really looking and making sure that you are aware and also asking other people. Like if you know people from that culture, you can ask some very general um, uh, information. Of course, it might not apply to that particular family, but I think it's good to just always be learning about that. Another question is, what are the family's child rearing practices, form of discipline, and expectations of children? We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but one, we want to identify achieve achievable behaviors that are in line with the family's expectations. So we want them to be age appropriate and functional, but they also need to be um, meaningful to the parents. Um, and a lot of educational programs for um, individuals with disabilities tend to focus on independence and autonomy um, and focus on those adaptive living skills. But some families might put more value on um, 
interdependence and um, caring for other people. And so they might not put as much emphasis on uh, self-help skills. So we have to talk to the family. I think um, the presentation this morning, Eileen Schwartz talked about uh, meaningful outcomes. So that, that um, is really important. Looking at what the family's behavior expectations are, um, because some families might uh, have an expectation of the child that we don't, yeah. um, that, that aren't in line with ours, but it, it needs to fit within their family. My expectations isn't important. It has to fit within theirs. Um, again, I was supporting, this was in Japan. I do some telehealth work with Japan, so um, I go back a couple times a year to provide training and whatnot. And one time I was working with a Japanese family in Japan. We were working on a PBS goal. The goal was to ride public transit. It was very important because this was their primary mode of uh, transportation. And the child was four-year-old at the time, and he had a tendency to kind of run up and down the train aisle, like the cars. And this was horrifying for mom because, again, in Japanese culture, respectfulness, don't do meiwaku, right? That was big for her. So she wanted to work on this. And we started off with a simple token economy system. We had a whole different strategies, but within three or four days of implementation, he was able to sit quietly. I was thrilled. I thought, good, we're done. And mom kind of approached me, mm, I don't feel really comfortable giving him a token. It's like, Okay, why? She said that, well, he's sitting, but he's, he's four. His legs don't touch the ground. His tiny feet were kind of swinging. And sometimes they would end up hitting the person that was standing in front of him. And for mom, that was horrifying. So I understand her expectation was much higher than mine. I had to also remind her, though, I think we need to slowly work up and get this current behavior established, and we can work our way up to more appropriate quiet sitting, but I realized that my expectation was far off and she had much higher expectation for her child. So it was kind of working with that as well and teaching her how to slowly increase expectations and how to use the token economy system to do that. So mm -hmm. I've worked with a couple um, Chinese families on dinner routines where they want the, the end goal is that they can sit at a restaurant during a family meal and but these meals are three hours long. So for it's an eight course meal, three hours long, no two year old would be able to sit through that without something to play with or going to take a break and walk around. And so um, I think it's finding that balance between uh, realistic expectations and also, um, but also looking at that with that culturally yeah. responsive lens. And then there's also um, identifying strategies that are aligned with families' child-rearing practices that we talked about earlier, that, that kind of spectrum of um, more maybe positive strategies where they're rewarding desired behavior versus using more um, threats or loss of privileges. So we have to look at what types of strategies the families are already using and they tend to use when we're making our plans as well. And then um, in the third section of um, this tool is um, more self-evaluation. So um, asking yourself the questions, have I discussed the roles and responsibilities of the family members and service providers in the process of PBS? Um, we want to explain the timeline to families sometimes um, because this process of PBS sometimes is difficult for families to understand at the beginning and sometimes they're concerned why change isn't happening quickly, why the service provider is not just providing an immediate solution to the problem. Um, so having to explain to them that there's actually a series of steps we have to do the assessment before we come up with a plan together with you, um, encouraging family involvement. Um, we talked about earlier some families kind of expect the expert to come in and um, and kind of just fix the problem. Um, but so explaining to the family that we really want their involvement um, in the development of a plan as well as the implementation of the plan. Um, and maybe some families need a little bit more time. Maybe at first we do need to step in more and have them kind of observe and then gradually encourage their involvement. Another question I want to ask is what community resources can I use to better serve this family? So there's lots out there. We did put some examples with some links there. You might not be able to read them. Um, we already talked about the UMID. Um, there's a lot of translated resources. ACT has lots of resources um, in different languages. I know there's, there's a couple links here for the Chinese and Punjabi ones because I think those are the two with the most resources. Um, the 
autism, the parent handbook is translated into nine languages, um, and that's available online. Um, I found a lot of really great resources through school websites, um, through when I was doing some research for when I was starting to work with the um, Syrian refugee family, I found on the Vancouver School Board website there was a whole PowerPoint done on um, information about working with um, Syrian ref ref uh, refugee families. So that was really helpful. Um, I know in the Surrey School District website there's a lot of um, written material that's translated into Punjabi. Um, so it's helpful to be able to have those resources to show parents, especially when they're trying to navigate the school system, showing them like, oh, this is these this is what's happening. This is the role of the EA or the SSA. There's so many ter so much ter terminology, right? So we want to be able to make that as simple as possible for them. Um, there's different organizations that provide interpretation and translation. I think through different school districts, you can get um, services through multicultural liaison workers and settlement workers. So sometimes they can be a great resource. Um, and Parent support groups, there's just a couple here, but I know there's tons of different ones um, that are specific to different cultural backgrounds, and that can just be a really nice um, resource for parents just to um, kind of get to know some other families and have somebody to talk to.